All right, good morning. Welcome back to day two of the Naval Warfare Studies Institute, Nimitz Research Group Warfare Innovation Workshop. We had yesterday our launch into this complex military problem space. Again, complex means not just complicated. You cannot calculate your way through it. You must explore this vast, dark problem space and find your way in. Yesterday, we had a keynote address from Admiral Boyle, Director of Maritime Operations of US Pacific Fleet, to introduce us to their wicked problem set. I then gave you two discovery panels, discovery being the first phase of user-centered design, sometimes called empathy, sometimes called exploration. I call it discovery. The first discovery panel was from a geopolitical and military perspective, looking at the problem space. And the second discovery panel was from an industrial allies and partners perspective. And today we have the tech perspective. Emerging digital technologies play a huge role in our futures, regardless of the wicked problem space you're playing in. And this panel this morning will be moderated by Lieutenant Colonel Kelly McCoy. He is our Naval Postgraduate School Strategy Chair. And I did not bring my reading eyes, so I actually can't read his bio that I printed. So I'm gonna allow him to introduce himself. Hold on. Thank you, Lila. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Lila. Um, so, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Kelly McCoy. Uh, very happy to be here today. Uh, and uh, as they say in the Web3 space, GM, in other words, good morning. Um, I teach at the intersection of technology, policy, and strategy here at Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, and I wanted to kind of give you a little background on this panel, uh, just because especially for NPS students, uh, there's a couple things in there that, that I think might be of use for you. First, uh, this panel is the result of uh, the uh, CS4095 Innovation Leadership class. Uh, if you have a innovation project, uh, if you have a thesis that you want to see uh, get turned into reality and not just a piece of paper, I highly encourage you to take this class. Uh, I went into it not fully knowing what, what I was walking into, uh, and I left uh, having had a whole bunch of new different conversations. Uh, one of these conversations is with uh, one of our panelists, uh, Jay Long, uh, who's operating in, in the space of uh, agile planning, uh, different emerging uh, technical and, and kind of uh, conceptual spaces. And uh, uh, we just kind of continued that conversation into this panel where we felt that this is a, uh, you know, an emerging space that is really important for national security experts to understand because it's, it has significant potential to change a lot of the ways in which we think about information, we think about problems and how we organize ourselves. The second piece I, I wanna highlight is, is basically what, what I teach about that technology uh, policy and strategy aspect. And there's three things I, I've, I've learned uh, from diving in and, and teaching on this subject. First, it's all about problems and understanding uh, the, the problems that, uh, that, that you're facing. Because if you define the problem incorrectly, you end up not solving uh, the problem that needs to be solved. Well, we're at this interesting uh, point in history that arguably any time before in history that's equal to now, I would say is between uh, the 17 to 1800s that were somewhere between the enlightenment period and the industrial, the first industrial revolution that it's in this period where, uh, you, you have Napoleon, uh, who's maximizing, uh, the enlightenment period to, to build his, uh, professional army, uh, to organize it in a manner that, that he can control it as the flow of information that's getting to him increases exponentially. 
Uh, you have uh, the Industrial Revolution with the Prussian army and Mulkey the Elder, uh, who uses operational art to be able to leverage uh, logistical trains, like literal trains, train tracks, uh, to, uh, to enable Prussia to not only survive, but thrive. The second piece is information. The speed, scale, and scope of information is changing and evolving. Uh, and that's going to impact how decisions are made. And then the third is how we organize ourselves to effectively leverage information to make and execute decisions. That's also going to have to evolve. And so when I teach, I teach from the perspective of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and the key aspect of this is that it's about the confluence of emerging technology. It's not about you know, artificial intelligence and singularity. It's about different technologies coming out at the same time, influencing each other, complementing each other, enabling each other, and emerging into something that we didn't even foresee uh, because those technologies aren't coming out individually they're coming out at the same time. And there's no topic that's better suited uh, for that than digital emerging technologies, Web3. And so that's what we're focused on here today. That's why we have uh, a panel of experts that are gonna be able to talk uh, cloud technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, blockchain, and innovative application. And so the question that's the, the primary question that, that was posed to, to this group uh, to focus on is how might emerging technologies operations in the information environment and new models of understanding human information systems enhance a combatant commander's ability to shape environments and compete with or deter adversaries beneath the threshold of armed conflict. So as you listen to these remarks from the panelists, I encourage you to put on your combatant commander's hat. And with that, what you learn, have that focus on what are the problems that need to be solved? How is information as we understand it today evolving? And how must we organize ourselves to effectively manage this evolving dynamic and arrive at effective decisions? And so with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Mr. Paul Puckett. He is the director of Enterprise Cloud Management Agency, where he serves as the principal advisor to the US Army's chief information officer, the G6, and other senior Army leaders on the Army's cloud strategy. Mr. Puckett, the floor is yours. Hey, sweet deal, thanks so much. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Gotcha. Hey, nice. Um, uh, so listen, I'm, I'm really honored to be uh, spending a little bit of time with uh, you guys today. Hopefully uh, it's not too terribly much uh, just me talking to people. Um, uh, typically, I prefer a, a conversation, but I would like to say uh, kind of a few things when it comes to all things cloud uh, and what I think that means for the Army, quite frankly, the DoD and uh, really in reality, uh, the world. Um, just a little bit of my background, just so you guys understand uh, who, who I am. Um, I uh, came into the workforce as a college dropout. Uh, I got a job doing desktop support as a contractor. Uh, learned my way through uh, to essentially becoming a, a team lead and a system engineer uh, responsible for uh, really running server operations for uh, the Pentagon. Um, pivoted to become a civilian at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, where I was fortunate enough to lead essentially all mission OCONUS for the National System for Geospatial Intelligence, uh, which means that uh, I've seen a lot of things uh, uh, that, can, that can go well, especially when you actually have people that focus on delivering a capability and an outcome. Um, and the reason my team existed in the first place was because the enterprise way of doing business was too slow. And, and hold on to that point. Uh, I quit the government uh, because my boss wouldn't make tough, tough decisions and there's nowhere else that I wanted to be at NGA uh, except for that office. And so I left. Uh, best decision I ever made because I saw the way that the world functions and how the world uh, essentially prioritizes uh, how you can actually capture a market and deliver a capability that people love. And then the army called me to lead this this office called the Enterprise Cloud Management Agency. Uh, we stood up two years ago. The whole entire point of the ECMO is because the Army has had numerous failed attempts at leveraging cloud computing to enhance the way that they 
deliver their mission. Um, and so quite frankly, the army did a Hail Mary, Mary pass. They created a random office uh, aligned to HQDA of all places, said that we had special authorities to go and deliver services beyond just strategize. Um, and now I'm a field operating agency within the Army delivering on the strategy that we articulated in the Army Cloud Plan of 2020. Um, here's why I think that the Army did that Hail Mary pass. Uh, the Secretary at the time believed, and I agree, that cloud computing is critical in order for us to respond in real time with data and software uh, in an ever-changing world around us. And there is no way whatsoever that we could possibly predict in the way that the DOD typically does business, all of the compute and store requirements to facilitate the mission that we have. Um, I was thinking of a, of a way to try and convey this narrative and you're gonna know that this is a joke, um, but could you imagine a world where uh, the Ukraine crisis happened? And thankfully, eight years ago, the army stood up the Ukraine crisis refugee program and established a program of record and essentially designed, acquired, and built out a data center to support uh, our ability to support refugees uh, moving across the border. Now, that didn't exist. What did exist is a secure cloud environment that 18th and 82nd reached out to me and said, I need infrastructure right now for a piece of software I just built to be fielded so I can support my soldiers at the border doing intake of refugees, uh, moving into safe haven. That did occur. And the only reason why we were able to essentially meet that mission need is because we had designed ourselves to respond. We had designed ourselves to react. And, and quite frankly, our ability to tap into digital infrastructure globally uh, in order to react to an ever-changing world around us, quite frankly, is an imperative to even compete, let alone win in a digital world that we live in today. And if you take a step outside of yourselves and you look at the commercial world around you and all the different capabilities and software that is changing at a mind-blowing rate, we see that the ability for three people sitting in their garage somewhere to fundamentally disrupt massive corporations that have essentially, quite frankly, to own a market for the you know, decades is because they've got the ability to be able to push a button, provision infrastructure globally to run their software, and then capture that market. Like if you go look at the case studies you know, around Uber, they took out an entire market, took out, but essentially they're now a major competitor with an entire market, and they didn't buy one stinking car. Like there's no need for them to go and physically procure every single car needed to go and compete. And if you think of a world without digital infrastructure, that's what they would have had to do. They would have had to get a major investment, go buy a crazy amount of cars and try and disrupt the market. Instead, with a piece of software, they tapped into every single car globally as a potential capability for what their ability to, to capture that market. So if we dive back into the DoD, are we actually designing ourselves to be able to respond and react in real time? Are we actually designing ourselves in a way where we welcome changing requirements late in the way that we do business and how we do acquisitions? Um, I typically love to go look at uh, the Agile Manifesto when I'm talking to people and trying to help them understand uh, why cloud computing matters in the way that we do business. And I'll call out, essentially, I believe it's the second uh, of the 12 principles that says we welcome changing requirements late even into development. And I say, what, what program office do you know in the army that currently has that as like the principles in which and how they, they function? Um, and people will laugh and I'll laugh too, but I really wanna get to the point where people are really frustrated about that. Because quite frankly, I'm really frustrated about that. So if I look at my ability to tap into globally accessible compute and storage as a service, um, and literally at the end of a network connection, I could now potentially have uh, my application and my data uh, delivered as a service and globally accessible by anyone in the world. Um, and that, that's a possibility that exists at the other click of a button. Uh, 
can you imagine if the entire DOD was designed and orchestrated to leverage that ability to the greatest extent possible? Think of our lead time to value for essentially our ability to meet a, a soldier's need. Um, I, I pause on that and, and I just, I'm mind blown for where we are today in the narrative and where we could be. Um, so if, if you kind of take a step back and understand this panel is all about different technologies and how we bring them to bear, quite frankly, our ability to tap into on-demand compute and storage as a service whenever and wherever we need it, to me is a, com a completely strategic asset for my ability to learn and adapt and then respond in real time to an ever-changing world around us. Um, and when we talk about the value of machine learning and artificial intelligence, friends, there is no program office in the world uh, that will ever be able to predict how much compute and storage we need in order to learn and then apply that knowledge. Uh, and so we have to tap into on-demand infrastructure uh, wherever, wherever we possibly can. Um, so I'm probably pretty close to, uh, to my time here. So there's a lot more to unpack on it. Uh, but the net net of the ECMA is to essentially deliver that asset as a service to the, uh, the United States Army. Um, and what's so beautiful about that is some of the outcomes that we've even seen beyond, the, um, beyond that path. Uh, and even today, uh, in an ad hoc world, where we typically field 428 physical instances of servers, 22 for every single one of those endpoints. Uh, and our fielding times typically fall within the three to four year range. Uh, we're currently delivering persistent mission command as a service where any core or division or any downtrace beyond them at the other end of a network connectivity can actually connect to persistent commission command as a service in a cloud operational today and immediately tap into operations and maneuverability. Uh, user pack, their lead time to do that prior to delivering this capability in the cloud was two months. And, and their big gripe with me was, hey, senior leaders aren't making decisions fast enough for where and how I wanna exercise because it takes me two months to prepare. And I say, quick question for you. Uh, do you think China is gonna hit you up two months ahead of time and say, hey, I think about doing some tough, some stuff in Taiwan, right? Here's your, here's your two months lead time. No, no, they are not gonna do that. They're gonna immediately move. And so I was like, your new requirement should be, I don't care when you make a decision, senior leader, choose whatever fabric you want. I'm gonna have the ability on demand to go to provision my capability whenever and wherever I want. And that's, that's the power of cloud computing as a strategic asset for the army and quite frankly, for the DOD. Um, and so that's, that's how I want you guys expecting the world uh, expecting essentially your future in the DOD for like how your services need to function is my hope and dream and desire is, is you as the future leadership are demanding that we need to organize and design ourselves around our ability to react. And that's, that's lean into a number of kind of principles, if you will. And there's some enabling technologies along the way, cloud computing being one of them. But I would argue most importantly is the actual mindset that we need to posture ourselves and the ability to react because we'll never be able to predict the future. So that's why I think cloud computing is uh, so super badass and such a strategic asset. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, the team. Awesome, thank you, sir. Uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Mustafa Kanan, who is an assistant professor here at Naval Postgraduate School, Information Sciences Department. His research interest is in complex adaptive systems behavior, decision-making, human-machine teams, digital twin, and human information processing. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, And there we go. Okay. So, um, uh, digital in transformation really open up interesting opportunities. That's for sure. And um, we are getting very good on developing AI systems. And and I think one of the problem is we are getting very good on them. And then eventually, what I think we need to realize that we need to system engineer that thing that is coming up 
uh, to our environment, how to do that, because um, it is mimicking human behavior with an incomplete way. And if we just continue to uh, be that much good in that limited capability, we may just inadvertently uh, limit ourselves in our decision environment. And I think that's something uh, that, that worries me in the way that I look into my research and engineering environment. So um, the first thing in that, in my, in that concept, context is uh, I like to explore the possibility of using digital twins to understand the, the, the operational environment that we uh, operate in. And in that sense, digital twin technology can provide uh, if an, an environment that can allow us to look at things from a systemic perspective, that we can simulate environment, we can simulate the decision-making agents and other entities in the environment, but it has its own uh, problems and that I like to explore them through the limitations that we uh, get through artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, systems that we have. And they are not really that much compatible with the humans in decision-making process. So there's, considerable evidence that supporting that machine learning and AI systems are really providing a good decision support. However, when it becomes context sensitive decision making environment, uh, machine learning system and AI systems, they are uh, not that good because at the end, they are based on data and data is done for causality. That's we all know from uh, Judea Pearl's statement. So, and these systems are considered narrow AI. They are narrow AI. There's no general AI. I don't know if in the foreseeable future we would have a general AI, but uh, narrow AI systems, they, are, they might be large, they might be complicated, but they are closed systems, which means that they don't process information. They, don't, they cannot glean context as we humans do. So we need to understand the, the, the design of these systems such that wh where these complications, these, these in incompleteness come from. And then in my own research, I tried to map it out to OODA loop environment. So how can I really replicate, for example, by using my engineered environment to understand, observe, orient, decision and act uh, phases and how can I distinguish them? Can I really use AI ML based systems all the time in my orient or am I killing myself in, 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 an, in a phase that I am really good over AI? So um, one way to look at this problem from the decision theory perspective, uh, human decision-making is probabilistic and dynamic and AI and ML based systems, they use also the same uh, logic probability theory to build up uh, some reasoning. And typically uh, these uh, decision theories are really a mature field and they are using probability theories that are based on uh, classical probability theory. And all this rational decision-making is based on this set theory based principles called Mogorovian axioms that are uh, that have been used and they are really good on modeling specific decision making processes. So, uh, but uh, if, if you had read um, uh, Stuart Russell's book on human compatible AI, book, he's one of the leading people in the AI uh, world, he also argues that the rational decision-making might be a problem from the AI perspective because we are good on that uh, rationality for one with AI systems, but when it comes to rationality for two, things get can complicated. Game theory partially can solve the problem, but then we end up with data tables, data fusion models, and then some problems that are associated with the rationality that is based on classical probability theory. Over the course of history, yes, there are some developments like utility theory, which is maximizing the expected value to come up with the best decision. And then uh, it failed and in certain aspects and people came up with uh, subjective utility theory. And then we had prospect theory and diffusion models of decision and uh, decision field theory. Those are the theories that are really providing certain solutions. But at the end, they are limited with the logic, classical logic that uh, needs to abide, that, that needs to confirm certain uh, classical uh, rules such as transitivity. So for example, if you prefer A to B 
And if you prefer B to C, then you prefer A to C. That's the basic logic that we all need to know. We all know that. So for example, if you prefer vanilla over strawberry ice cream and then strawberry over chocolate, and then you have to prefer vanilla over chocolate. But what if I remove strawberry from the decision environment? Things then get complicated and human decision-making is then classified as categorized as uh, irrational decision making, but it is, we are just coming to the point again, what type of rationality that we are looking for? Are we just limiting ourselves with that limited classical probability theory as pers perspective of rationality? So, and then decision theories evolved and people started to apply different probabilistic theories to decision environments and uh, they ended up with for example applying a quantum probability theory to understand human behavior and coherently explain certain aspects of uh, decision making process for example in the situation where you drop the possibility of strawberry which is uh, directly going from a to c and how you can explain that type of behavior when it comes to decision making in operational environment uh, that dropping the strawberry aspect, dropping the A to B, B to C environment, dropping the B, it's related to the orient aspect of the decision making. And that is where uh, humans are, uh, or they can, uh, they can be more powerful than the AI system. So relying on AI systems in digital environments that we are collecting data, analyzing them and simulating them, brings us to the question do i really need to do, do i really need to uh, use ai systems as they are or can i just improve them by system engineering approaches by considering human as open system and then integrating them uh, with ai into environments in my own research when i look at the things uh, from human information processing perspective or human machine team interaction uh, machines can help us to, for example, uh, regulate our communication patterns, and that give us a, a more team behavior, more concrete team behavior without really violating the uh, team behavior. But uh, if we then over rely on them uh, without really uh, having any limits, just pulling more, inform pulling more information or being pushed more information, we can create more uncertainty in our own decision-making environment and fail to make a proper decision. That's what we observed in our decision-making uh, tests and uh, team uh, science experiments that we conducted. So uh, one solution that we came up with in the digital twin environment, integrating uh, or engineering this new tool that we have while we are having constant information flow how can I understand a human in this environment as an open system and then uh, apply the known decision rules along with the new emerging technologies and emerging new theories? How can we better capture the human behavior and design uh, human compatible uh, teams and digital environments such that they would not kill our capabilities that are uh, sitting in front of us in the orient loop while we can then uh, make better decisions. So integrating from uh, tactical to strategical or strategical to tactical uh, levels, uh, when you change from observe orient decision act, the, the, the outcome of the combated commander to the operational or tactical level will be an act. So they don't really share whatever they have in their orient environment. So how we can come up with more uh, context sensitive decision fusion models such that we can preserve the contextuality at the tactical level and then simulate the environment at the uh, strategic level to provide better decision uh, support. Because at the end, if I, I need to make a decision at 6 p.m. today, there is no way to speed up that decision. I need to understand the environment and get ready by that time to make the decision. Making that decision at 550 is not gonna make me a better decision maker. So we have to understand the environment and the essence of understanding environment to me is not really accessing the information all the time, but rather to understand the context sensitivity of the information. And uh, for that purpose, I believe we have to look for larger uh, decision theories and how information processing at the human level occurs differently than AI ML based systems. Thank you.
Dr. Kane. Next up, we have Dr. Victor Fang, who's the CEO and co-founder of Anchain.ai, an AI-powered Web3 blockchain cybersecurity startup focusing on empowering high-profile customers such as the SEC and other U.S. government agencies. Dr. Fang, the floor is yours. Cool. Cool. Thank you, Michael. And it's a uh, truly honor to be here. Uh, and my background, maybe I should start with my uh, little a bit about my career story, right? I spent uh, my more than 10 years uh, building algorithms and software to fight with the uh, APT malware, the advanced persistent threat, uh, before I started Enchain AI. And uh, those APT malware, um, I deal with, right, with my team at FireEye Mendian, including like some of the nation state malware, APT, coming from uh, Russia and North Korea. By using, I mean, the narrow AI that Dr. Kanan just mentioned, machine learning kind of power data-driven algorithms is getting pretty good accuracy detecting some of the uh, behavior characteristics on those malware, APT malware. And then during that time, right, I saw there was an adoption of the hackers are using cryptocurrency for ransomware. You cannot think about a better way of monetizing and capitalizing on dark web using cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, Monero and all that. And then, yeah, that, that's what actually um, inspired me to start my own company in uh, San Jose, California in 2018. Um, and um, so since starting, right, that company, um, we, we want to be the guardians of the Web3 digital assets. So we, we are very fortunate to be working with the US government, like the SEC and a few others, and also the private sector, like the financial institutions. And uh, my, my talk today will be more focusing on the strategic level. Um, and the aim is to encouraging innovations because Web3 and DAO is just the beginning. There's a lot of area that we can innovate. So maybe I should start with a few concepts, right? So um, yeah, cryptocurrency. So as you guys know, uh, Biden, right? President Biden just uh, published the executive orders just a few days ago, right, on cryptocurrency. And as a entrepreneur in this space, right, this is actually an exciting year for, for our industry, for cryptocurrencies and digital assets and all that. I think it's a watershed year. And it's also interesting to see the timing about that, that executive order is actually published around the Russia and the Ukraine war, right, on March 9th. And but actually, in fact, it was being uh, planning for years in the U.S. government because that's actually a, like those six area that the executive order mentioned, right? So, it's uh, the U.S. government has de have defined the Web three and cryptocurrency as the national security, a very a strategic um, direction for the for the U.S. to stay competitive in the space, and. Um, and the second thing I'm going to talk about is the, the concept of the Web3, right? What is a Web3? Um, it's actually the new internet based, based on uh, blockchain and smart contract. It's a new digital infrastructure. It's a new internet, okay? So, and then to understand Web3, we should probably um, wind, wind back the time a little bit, right? So what is Web1 and Web2? So Web1 is basically the... Uh, uh, web 1.0 is read only. Remember those uh, yellow page and static web page, right? That holds the you know, internet. And then the web two is read and write. And it's actually also pretty remarkable, right? So because that's the first time other than just viewing, browsing the web page, uh, you can actually write to the state of the internet. For example, you can post on Twitter, you can post on LinkedIn, on Facebook. And what does that mean? You are writing, you are altering the state of the internet, okay? And that's that wave of uh, revolution happened in, um, around uh, 2004, around the year about 2000, 2004. And then here we come, right? The Web3. The Web3 is the most, the most recent innovation in this digital uh, infrastructure, the, in the new internet. And what it basically adds, bringing a new characteristic is the verifiable. So now is the first time that you can verify your ownership to the information for the first time in the history. So think about it, right? Web two, what does that mean? When you post a Twitter or Facebook, you are recording, you are writing a state of the internet, that's right. But those data are owned by the internet companies. It's not owned by you. It's, it's, you are altering the state literally in their database in the data center, okay? 
And the Web3 is remarkable because now it's the, really the first time that we have the ownership of the data. For example, the, uh, whoever that owns the, the private key of the Bitcoin wallet has the ownership of the digital asset, okay? So the Web3, I think uh, I, I summarizing three key characteristics, right? One is resilience. So it's all thanks to the decentralized consensus algorithms and all that. So think about it. Bitcoin now is at a market cap of about $1 trillion, okay? Bitcoin was about $1 trillion of today. And this new asset just created like 10, 20, like 10 12 years ago. And has been running for more than 10 years in a super adversarial environment. Just think about it. How many countries, how many hackers trying to bring it down, try to steal from it, right? But it's super resilient. It's been running for more than 10 years. And there's no customer service. Everything is running, is running on its own. Okay. That's resilience. And second is the uh, verifiability, right? That's where the cryptography, the mathematics come in. So the entire data ownership and all that is all powered by this, all these cool cryptography algorithms, right? Like elliptic, uh, elliptic curve. RSA, zero knowledge proofs and all that. And that is actually the, the, the building block of the very key essential building block of the Web3, okay? The verifiability is all powered by the cryptography. And then the third one is the flexibility. And I wanna mention that is actually the smart contract is the key component of the Web3 innovation because it's actually adding a lot of flexibility for for the developers to write their own software. And again, when you, when you finish and deploy that piece of smart contract source code, right? It, it's running on its own. You don't need an expert like, uh, like Paul to maintain the infrastructure in the cloud. That software will run on its own, okay? So resilience, verifiability, and flexibility. That's my, my summary of the Web3 characteristics. And then let's move on to the, the third concept I'm gonna talk about, the DAO, right? So the decentralized autonomous organization. I think this is also very relevant to this uh, audience, right? So the DAO is basically is an organization created by software developers, okay? To one, to automate decision-making, okay? And second, to facilitate the transactions. And again, it's building on top of the Web3, so is again, you don't need an expert like Paul to, to manage and do that for on the infrastructure. It's good when you deploy that software, that smart contract is gonna run on its own. And DAO is not controlled by any institution like a government or central bank. No, it does not require that. And it's actually owned by whoever that owns the, um, that have access to the private key. Okay, that's why security and all that is super essential in this setting. So, yeah, so I quickly go over these three concepts like cryptocurrency and Web3 and DAO, right? So now, as of 2022, right, where are we? What's the status, status quo of Web3? I would say it's still quite early. I was still, still too early, although Bitcoin has been around for 10 years, right? I would say Web3 in 2022 is probably like uh, the Web2 in 2004 when, when Facebook and Twitter and all that just, just started, okay? So there's two angles, right? The engineer being uh, aspired to, 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 to innovate. One is the security side. This basic, the, the basic infrastructure is still quite vulnerable, vulnerable as I would say, right? So uh, we have been helping our customers to, to harden the smart contract or the web story infrastructure away from hackers and all that. And it's, it, the problem with like, the risk is really because the web story the digital asset is so liquid, okay? When you get that private key, you basically have that asset, okay? That's why you're seeing those great news about, oh yeah, Solana got hacked by what, $200 million and the hacker pulled away like 10, 10 100, million dollars from exchanges and all that, right? It's exactly because of security problem. And second, the compliance, right? Hackers, scammers, terrorists, right? That's a $10 billion per year kind of a dark web industry, right? And especially like right now, 
there are some, I mean, start to have some little evidence around like how, how the Russia is actually trying to uh, bypass the SWIFT, the, a SWIFT ban, right? So to actually by leveraging the cryptocurrency and, and to us is a no brainer, right? So cryptocurrency, the defense mechanism is actually not as mature as other financials, um, cybersecurity applications and all that. So it's totally possible that, um, yeah, that the, the bad actors may use cryptocurrency to by bypass all the, uh, all the detections and sanction and all that. And then lastly, let's talk about the application in this uh, space, right? So I think Web3 and DAO, right, has been evolving in the past 10 years in a very adversarial environment. And in fact, there's actually, there are some people are raising, raising, are doing a fundraising for Ukraine, right? Um, using a DAO. There's actually a few DAOs out there for raising funding for the, for the, the Ukrainians, uh, ref, refugees and all that, because some of them may not have access to the banks. And that's where the DAO and Web3 can actually kick in. And it's the application, right? It's think about Web3 and DAO, right? It's all about trust. Okay, how do you automate decisions? How do you facilitate transactions in an adversary environment like the battlefield and all that? It's all about how do you establish trust with the, inside that adversary environment? So I think the area for the audience to explore innovation in the DAO and Web3 is those three angles I mentioned, the resilience, flexibility, and verifiability. And um, yeah, so it's just like I said, this is a Web3 in 2022 is like Web2 in 2004. So yeah, say you, you have a time machine and now you're standing at a new way. You're literally just standing in front of a new wave of digital infrastructure revolution. That's the Web3 and that. Exciting, exciting time for Web3 and the loss of uh, innovation ahead of us. So I will stop here. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Victor. That, that was awesome. Um, last up, we have Captain Jay Long. He's an Army Reservist and a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute, an Army Mad Scientist and a National Security Innovation Network Startup Innovation Fellow. Most recently, he co-led a sprint on possible Web3 applications for national security use, along with the 101st Airborne Division's Innovation Accelerator, Eagle Works. Jay, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. I want to start by saying I'm grateful to be here, and it's been awesome to learn from the other panelists so far. I'll start with what I hope today's participants walk away with, and that is the understanding that they are positioned to fundamentally change the trajectory that this tech develops in. In fact, the national security ecosystem and the tech sector startups require their engagement. I think oftentimes as a community, we approach this from the perspective that warfighters are looking down into non-mission and things are supposed to appear. And I understand that that worked pretty well back when we inherited hardware and we got operational systems from external organizations. That model really doesn't work in the digital environment because everything is predicated on the data that they are generating and the operational context only they can provide. And so I think everyone in the audience is really well positioned to be the determinant X factor on how well can we integrate concepts like DAOs or automated decision-making using AI tools or cloud infrastructure into operational concepts. And that's contingent on their ability to understand these tools, which in turn requires a lot of upscaling on their own. Uh, a lot of traditional military pathways haven't evolved to train these skills at scale. And so as a community, we're facing this gap where there's a clear recognition of the need to bring organic data analytics, software engineering, cloud engineering talent to the tactical edge. But there's not necessarily established pipelines. And the military call them MOSs. I'm sure the Navy calls them something else. And so that the leaders in the audience say are really well positioned to influence our success in getting after these goals. And so I, I think core things to know is one, you will have unique and nuanced understanding of your problem space that nobody else has. Even the best and well-intentioned startup does not understand the operational environment within Indo Paycom or the exact well scope problem you're seeking to solve. And absent a well-defined problem, even the best intended tech won't be successful in doing it. Secondly, that those in the audience and the, the formations are gonna be leading need to understand from a pattern recognition perspective, the operational challenging they're facing is best solved by what type of tech. And the AI has gotten a lot of attention, quantum has gotten a lot of attention, sometimes it's basic software. So learning to understand the trade-offs between these different solutions and how they need to work together 
is predicated on first understanding your operational environment and then understanding the underlying competencies and challenges of, of individual tech stacks. And that then allows you to give targeted feedback to development teams in the rear. And the Army has invested a ton of money and resources into ECMA, the Army Software Factory, and the AI Task Force. But those are only as effective as the operational data sets they're ingesting and the feedback they're getting from forward formations. And so it's an inherent or as a new professional responsibility for these groups to start thinking through operational context with an eye towards deploying these technologies. I, I think the Ukraine problem set is, has been voiced and I think it's humbling to consider that as challenging as Ukraine has been for everyone from the Ukrainian strategic corporals forward at the tactical edge to America's decision makers at the National Security Council, challenges in the Indo-PACOM theater are arguably worse for a couple of reasons. One, it's more dispersed. Two, we don't necessarily have the same strength of alliances for data sharing agreements, which means our capacity to understand the operational environment is harder. And then three, there's a lot bigger span in the type of languages we're ingesting and the type of data sets that we're ingesting and the translation requirements. All those come together to create what is likely to be an open source blizzard of information where we are flooded with status of our forces, anticipated status of, of enemy forces, understanding of how the civilian population and general sentiment is shifting, and we now need a way to meaningfully ingest that, translate it, make sense of it, and act upon it. And a lot of our traditional legacy systems weren't intended to do that. When data is siloed on an individual ship or an individual unit and can't feed a deeper data fabric that goes all the way up to the National Security Council, we are going to be making decisions based on what we anticipate being the reality. And something I think useful to learn from here is America's response to COVID. You know, we struggled a lot to understand where the pandemic was going in the early months, in part because we didn't have effective data integration. Our models were based on best assumptions. And so there's a lot of actions that were taken, a lot of money that was expended that didn't necessarily translate into better care. And after that, as an analog for a situation where if we don't know how to leverage cloud infrastructure like Mr. Puck has developed, and we don't know how to think through the types of questions we're seeking to ask and the answers we need, as, as Dr. Kanan spoke about, we will be unable to leverage those things at speed. And the, the field grade and above audience assembled today is in a position where they can inform how their units train these competencies. And these need to become automatic battle drills and reflexive parts of how they function well before conflict happens. Because in part, these are always growing. So identifying where data engineering work is required, where data sets aren't connected, where features don't work, is just as critical because that feedback allows us to rapidly accelerate our ability to impact the operational status quo. Uh, and, and something that I think is also relevant to draw from Ukraine and to think about within the context of Indo-PACOM is we are in a position now where the number of relevant actors in this space has never been larger. Once upon a time to reach a global audience, you needed to have a ton of internal public affairs opportunities and, and marketing reach. That is now done at the lowest level, which means when you're thinking about coordinating decentralized action, it's no longer enough to be unified as a government or even unified with your allies or partners. Now we need to think through how might we engage and interact with NGOs in the region or other government agencies in the region, or even individual civilian actors. How do we gather all the information necessary to understand where they're positioned in terms of perhaps sentiment or the way that they're influencing the general narrative? And how do we feed that into decision-making cycles that allow us to effectively act? That the, the concept of Web3 is helpful here because DAOs afford us a mechanism to collaborate with groups we've never been able to reach before because it's no longer required for security purposes to be all in the same network. You can be decentralized. In fact, a lot of Web3 principles are based on zero trust. We start from the expectation that nothing can be extended and accordingly collaboration in that space can be ar arguably sandboxed. And then smart contracts may sound like a different, you know, an ethereal concept, but it's worth considering that if we can automate decisions that we know we need to make and responses that are critical, that buys us space and time. And I think if we're looking at the cognitive like decision cycles of, of US military teams versus others, one of the biggest things we have working for us is that we can go decentralized because there's a high level of trust. This is an essentially run organization. And so how do we then integrate emerging technologies to build off that competitive advantage and allow us to be effectively decentralized and empower our personnel in a way that is perhaps most relevant in liberal democratic cultures. And so I think there's a lot of work that this community can help spearhead in integrating effective human machine teaming for decision-making at the edge. And that's from the, the company commander all the way up to the GCC commander. Similarly, mapping out where we have gaps in cloud infrastructure for data sharing and data ingestion is gonna be critical. And then starting to explore how might emerging technologies like blockchain fundamentally alter our ability to make sense of our environment and leverage influence, something we discuss quite often to achieve operational effects. 
And I just ask that everyone here recognize that they're in a unique position to tackle those challenges. This is no longer separation of operational commanders and technologists. Those are becoming overlapped. And it starts with just taking the, the time to ask good questions, connect with groups in the space, and upskill professionally these technologies. And Kelly, I'll turn it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. So with that, uh, we'll now transition to uh, the Q&A portion um, here in the, the uh, auditorium. Uh, just please come down to the microphone to be able to ask your question. Uh, and then if uh, you're on the, uh, the Zoom, uh, just raise your hand and, and we'll get you called in. And as people are formulating their questions, I'll uh, start off with my own. Um, so first, over to, to Mr. Puckett, I'm curious on uh, how cloud, uh, how the cloud's going to influence the way we fight. And a, a, as you had put in our uh, pre-panel discussion, uh, is cloud the gateway drug for uh, a more agile force? Yeah, I think I made a bad joke about heroin. Um, uh, so yeah, I think it's influential the way we fight. Uh, there's a few things to unpack on that. Everyone should be aware of the joint all domain command and control, uh, initiative that is ongoing. Uh, there are a few fundamental principles that have to be true in order for joint all domain command and control to come to fruition. And first is the ability to connect in the first place, right? Like I, I can't have joint all domain and command and control unless I can actually see in some way, shape or form and connect to any sensor, any shooter in order to facilitate that, that decision authority, if you will. Uh, so network connectivity is imperative. Um, and that to date has typically been the argument why we can't have common services and capabilities. Uh, like I can't connect to you and my ability to connect to you is always in contest. Uh, and so therefore I just need to exist on my own uh, in my own autonomous way offline with no connectivity to the world. And that's how I'm going to thrive. Um, and the reality is in the, in the world around us, our ability to see and manipulate data in real time requires our ability to connect. And so um, what is typically put up you know, as the main reason why we can't leverage cloud computing is because of one of the core characteristics of broad network access, I would argue, is now fundamental to the way that we want to fight. Uh, and so then beyond that, if I have connectivity, the second really is if I have connectivity, my ability to discover and use data and turn it into uh, decisions uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and for the rate and the speed uh, that we are creating data, and then also for learning from our legacy systems that have not, not been uh, one designed or even two resource enabled for that I'll say ad hoc uh, kind of decision-making and curiosity to learn from that data is in order to deliver that data in anywhere and any way that we need it, we're gonna have to have on-demand infrastructure uh, just at the push of a button to be able to take on the, the resource requirements for how I want to see and manipulate data, let alone for how much data we're producing over in time. Like everything is becoming a sensor and everything is now something that we need to be able to see and aggregate. Um, and so uh, to me, I see it as, as foundational, but like back to something that Jay said, like digital infrastructure for the sake of digital infra infrastructure has a crazy amount of potential value, but it's not actually realized value unless we design our actual systems and services and data sets to leverage it. So there's a lot of work uh, to be done there to actually make uh, digital infrastructure valuable uh, uh, realized value uh, for the way that we fight. But uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say the long story short might be too late. Yes, I think it's foundational to, to changing the way that we fight. Um, and from a, from a gateway drug perspective, um, I see it as table stakes. I see it as literally like the ante um, just to be able to play the game. Uh, I don't see it as the game itself. I literally see it as just, you know, pushing a few chips in just to even see cards on a table. Um, it's, it's how we then play the game and being masters at that game, quite frankly, which really gets into our ability to have uh, digital overmatch against our, uh, our adversaries. Great, thank you. Uh, 
just for the audience, we do have the chat up. So if you have a question you want to write into the chat, um, we'll, we'll follow up with that. But I do have a couple of questions here in the room. Yeah, I just see the one the one in chat. My, my joke about the data center was not actually real. Uh, there is no data center that exists for Ukraine refugees. They're leveraging services in the cloud. Uh, and so the answer is uh, yes, from a compute and storage, it does. Uh, two, from a connectivity perspective, uh, we're actually running real-time operations on secret, uh, leveraging um, uh, our friends over at SpaceX. Well, well really it's, it's all things Starlink. Um, but that's how we're running current operations today in support of uh, our wartime efforts. Uh, and then other efforts, obviously, in uh, tapping into existing uh, commercial transport and fiber where possible uh, and leveraging long haul there. Um, and that, as you know, with the networks that we have today is uh, an ongoing effort to truly become transport agnostic. But uh, we've had great success leveraging uh, Starlink to date for Secret. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, good morning. My name is Matt Halligan. I am from the Naval Undersea Warfare Center in Newport, and a lot of my work focuses on submarines. And Mr. Puckett, you talk about how the power of cloud computing, it lies in being able to dynamically provision this hardware, uh, short lead times, being ready as soon as possible. Um, but I don't see how this can be applied to submarines that are not frequently connected. Typically they're underwater, where they don't have any communications of that sort. So I was curious how you see a cloud computing being applied to a, an environment like that. Sure. So uh, cloud computing, if we go to the definition are really just characteristics of how that infrastructure is designed. Um, especially if you look at the world of the internet of things today, where we're able to push uh, inferences and essentially decisions to be made closer to the edge is no different than you and I at home being curious about something around our smart home and being uh, uh, quite frankly frustrated with the delay to ping the cloud to get an answer. Like I can't tell you how many times Siri on my phone is just completely worthless uh, because I have no network connectivity. So if we get after taking the compute and storage resources that we do allocate on submarines today and start to design them in a way where they meet the characteristics of cloud computing, I would argue that the last mile of broad network access can totally be a uh, kind of an intermittent thing. Uh, but most importantly is when submarines do have connectivity for their capabilities and services to be an extension of global resources uh, from co a compute and storage perspective. And then also in real time, the ability for people to push capabilities and services uh, as we learn how we operate uh, two submarines uh, while they're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, that intermittent connectivity and those uh, computing and storage resources be designed as an extension of a global resource pool makes them simply meet the characteristics of, uh, of cloud computing. And then the broad network access piece just simply becomes you know, that intermittent ad hoc thing. Um, but again, it's, it's just a design characteristic. We can no longer field systems where we presupposed a fixed architecture that cannot change in real time when the opportunity uh, presents itself um, and network connectivity being that opportunity. Hopefully that lands. Warren Gents, uh, Captain Nick Royer, just student at MPS. I'm, I'm gonna do a little bit of improv to preface my question. But let's say that in an alternate future, I'm a, is Colonel Pugh in here? Okay, so I'm a colonel in charge of an artillery unit. And I understand the need for some of the things you're talking about, about sensing and distributing and, you know, passing on fire solutions and things like that. So I'm, I'm talking to a group of civilian experts, much like yourselves. And the first expert I talked to clearly knows a lot about a lot, but everything he's saying is laden in Silicon Valley buzzwords and I'm not really capable of internalizing that and understanding it. Again, it's all hypothetical. Um, the next expert I talked to is an academic who is very intelligent, clearly, knows what he's talking about, but he's like way up here and I'm like down here because I'm just a crayon eater. And I'm not really able to effectively draw information he's trying to impart and the solutions he's trying to offer. And then the next expert I talked to got his start doing computer vision for a country we're not exactly on friendly terms with currently. So I'm gonna be concerned about him for security terms and I'm not gonna be able to internalize uh, his advice and the solution he offers. 
So, and in the last expert I talked to, you know, great, he's military, he speaks my language, he's fantastic, but he's just a captain, I'm a colonel, and the Marine Corps being the Marine Corps, you know, I'm not necessarily going to take his advice fully. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm playing a little bit of a character here, but I think that the question I'm trying to get to is, um, especially with some of our leadership, there are significant cultural barriers between the tech world that's offering solutions, whether that's in the private sector, public-private partnerships or academia, and the military. Um, obviously, there's different challenges faced by different individuals trying to offer solutions. So how do we bridge that gap culturally between the military and realms where these solutions are coming from? Um, because I think that cultural barrier to adoption is something that's really going to prevent us as, as an institution from making use of the value you guys offer. To the group. Kelly, Thomas. mind if I happen here? Yeah, go for it, Jay. Yeah, so a couple of things on that one. What I'm hearing, I'm hearing two issues. One sounds like, where do I place the capability to del deliver fire solutions? The other one is, how do I understand this new group, uh, which, which speaks to me of a translation consideration. And so I'd actually borrow from practices that work in Afghanistan and other places. One, sometimes you need a, a translator within the organization. Uh, and things that can help here are components like the reserves. The Marine Corps Cyber Auxiliary exists to house digital talent that can be taken on to standard formations that will problem curation, solution development, translation, a host of other things. Additionally, you've, you've got reservists within the Marines and the Joint Services, many of whom are embedded within the tech sector. And there are thousands of them. And again, through the Marine Cyber Auxiliary and other programs, you should be able to get access in fairly straightforward. Our, I, I work with an organization that actually uses those really extensively as domain SMEs. So one of it is translation, get a translator. There are some government approved sources that are embedded the other one is, I think we need to start challenging what we permit within the confines of like professional education. So I came from an infantry background and the battalion commander is unlikely to be in a foxhole shooting, but he's still expected to qualify. There's a base recognition that to deploy systems, you need some understanding of its conceptual limitations so you can best exploit them and resource them. And I think for some reason in the digital space, we tend to treat that as an adjacent and not necessarily a foundational skill set. And so one of the things that offers is that there's probably value in pursuing professional education, at least to the point where you can understand the conversations and inform them, in part because you're not pursuing that knowledge for its own sake, but it allows you to extend and support your mission at a higher level. There's a ton of programs between AFWORKS, uh, the Defense Innovation Unit, the Defense Innovation Board, ENSIN, National Security Innovation Network, which is a funded OSD program that exists to provide the connective tissue so military leaders can get the exposure they need to be intelligent consumers of capability and not have somebody try to talk fast and pull the wool over their eyes. So, you know, step one translator is step two, uh, professional development. And then I think step three is empowering your formation to help generate those solutions, right? Uh, within the context of, of data analytics and business modernization, by training uh, Marines or soldiers in my case to become data analysts, you know, a 10 to 12 week virtual boot camp is fairly standard. And the Air Force has units on a GSA contract that you can send them to. They can start identifying opportunities for efficiency. So you may be focused on the last five meters of the fight in this case, the fire mission, but how might we optimize business processes to get our guns in the right position? How are we gonna optimize the supply located behind us and what rounds we have up and how do we run pattern analysis at speed at the tactical level on our standard requirements so that we can best position our personnel, our ammo, our weapon systems for likely targets. Like those are things that are hard to solve with a traditionally organized unit, but are not outside the realm of essentially like an elevated use of Excel. And so I think there's a lot of ways to get after some of these things and, and there, there are opportunities to better use the talent within the formation, vice having to invent a, a new solution. I'll turn it back to the panel, but thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll double click on, on translators. Uh, uh, one of the greatest assets to the stand-up of the ECMO, now the ECMA, is military representation to act as translators of here is how the Army is going to interpret what you say to them. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's a strategic investment. What I said in chat is uh, I've met with too many companies in Silicon Valley that have absolutely no clue whatsoever how their product is actually integrated into the business of the Army and therefore how it's applied to operations and makes our lives better. Um, and if you have no ability to tell why it matters and all you can talk about is just, you know, what your product is and how great the tech is, you quite frankly have, have no value to anyone because at the end of the day, 
uh, how do you defend that investment? Uh, operational leaders are gonna talk about operational outcomes. They're not gonna talk about tech for tech's sake. And I know I'm the moderator, but you, you touched a third rail there. So I'm gonna jump in too. Um, you know, by putting, your, you know, putting yourself through this fictional character in a, in a future sense, I think there's a key component there that needs to be addressed. And it's, it's the organizational learning capacity that has to be done in the joint force looking to the future. So that by the time you're a colonel, you know, maybe you're looking at SP MEGTAF, uh, command on the horizon, um, it's, we have to have leaders that are able and willing to learn and not let their biases control them. And so to be able to look at someone and assume, uh, you know, where they're coming from, we may not have been on the best terms with, uh, is, is in, inconsequential. Um, and that kind of bias is going to cause us to lose a war. Um, and that organizational learning aspect is uh, so inherent, and, you know, and it's something that, that the Commandant talks to uh, really challenges the way we think militarily, because the go-to is to be like, all right, we're hierarchical. Uh, but, you know, in, in reality, uh, since 2004, we haven't been hierarchical. Uh, I, I remember being in Iraq as an assistant S2 uh, for a light infantry battalion, and I went to the brigade engineers. And I said, I need this product because we got a mission brief. And they said, ah, the best way to get it is to go to division. So what do I do? Well, I go to division and I talk to those engineers and they provide me the, the stuff I need. I get back and then I get my counseling statement for being a lieutenant in a battalion going straight to division. That was the last time I was ever discouraged from going outside of the chain of command to get a job done. Uh, and maybe it has to do with rank, but uh, from my recollection, uh, there was a pivot point about 2005, 2006, where the US military realized that we were getting into such complex operations that we could no longer function as a solely hierarchical force, that we had to adopt an enterprise type focus. And so there, uh, on my follow on deployment to Afghanistan, that's where you have the 10th Mountain G2 bring in uh, anybody and everybody from the intelligence community. And it wasn't just to get briefings from these people that you know, have access to super high intelligence, it's to develop network connections. And so that when I'm in Afghanistan, I know the exact analyst that's focused on my area that I can reach back to, or I can provide information that they're gonna find value for. Uh, and, and so it's like, now we're starting to break down these, these, uh, these hierarchical chains that are inhibiting us from being able to, to get out, learn, and be more effective. And uh, uh, the last part is that complexity issue, is that uh, joint all domain command and control, uh, one of the best ways I, I've heard it uh, was from, uh, I believe it was Admiral Harris, former Indo-PACOM combatant commander. He called it the Uber of fires, that basically you're pulling up your app and uh, you're selecting you know, what your target is, and then you're seeing the option of, of you know, what, you know, what can you put on that target? Imagine the amount of decentralization that has to happen to that. Imagine a ship captain being like, uh, I'm, I'm putting my ship on Uber uh, to you know, let somebody ping me so that we could direct fires to. I mean, that's, that's like sacrilegious. I mean, no commander is gonna wanna just put their unit on Uber, you know, for somebody to ping them so they, they can get a ride. But that in essence is the future. That if we uh, maintain uh, our biases, we maintain an unwillingness to adapt and evolve, we're gonna end up like Russia in Ukraine. We're gonna have ourselves stuck in mud and tractors pulling our tanks away. But if we establish the, an organizational learning ability, we establish uh, network design and how we engage with each other, and we embrace the complexity of our operations uh, and you know, move towards a more decentralized model, we're opening up a whole new capability that you know, the, the world hasn't seen yet. So I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll get off my soapbox. Should have gone marine engineers to begin with, sir. Yeah. So um, 
I'd like to address your question and also uh, going back to Kelly's question about agility. Um, um, I think one problem that I see even in the academia, people think they communicate, but they just communicate over buzzwords. So for example, one of the most abused words is quantum. Uh, so um, I'm a, I have two PhDs, one in physics, one is in system engineering. And I was joking to system engineers, um, uh, if you can repeat syst word system in one minute, 30 times you become a good system engineer, that's how they evolve. And, but they don't question what is it, and same thing for quantum. Oh, quantum is the solution and agility is the solution. I think the, the key point is to ask, what do I need to know about the topic that is being discussed? Because when you enter a meeting, you might be talking to a Google expert, which they Google the term and then within 10 minutes, they think they can speak about that thing and enter into the meeting and tell about that thing by using just buzzwords, ask the right question. What do I need to know about a quantum system, for example? What does it tell me? What does system engineering perspective uh, for this issue tell me about? How can I leverage that point? We don't need to know everything. We just need to know as much as my requisite variety can support that I can absorb and use it. So uh, that's the key thing that I learned uh, after going back to graduate school and then uh, joining the Air Force Research Lab, for example. It, it was a different environment, but the people were using buzzwords in different contexts. So for example, um, in that regard, uh, that agile force that you ask, um, does real-time connectivity give rise to an agile force that's that's the question that i keep asking myself when i'm trying to understand team behavior because uh, what i'm trying to do instead of using the term agile not not as a buzzword I, how can i really quantify and express agile mathematically that's what i'm trying to do but when i see that real-time connectivity can kill agility because uh, team performance scales uh, for for a four hour mission that we we have, we were we we gave to our uh, experimenters, in a four four hour mission, team performance scales uh, around 30 39 communication uh, frequency in a 40 four hour mission. You cannot improve your team performance by more communication. It's not going to work. And meanwhile. What we've also discovered that over communication kills the agility. Agility for me is to maintain the team behavior by changing your communication behavior. So that's what I how I started it. What does agility mean here? Do I need to really understand in the way that they just tell me to understand, or do I need to really question, complexify it, and then apply into my own environment? Because agility in Context A means something and context B may mean something different. So for that reason, we need to question, do I need to connect every time, like submarine question? Maybe I need a digital twin in my submarine and I don't need to connect to the real environment for six months. Okay, then I can, how do I can leverage, how can I leverage digital twin capability to simulate uh, my operational environment there without having connection? So, but agility doesn't mean, for example, real-time connection to me because it kills team performance if you over communicate over connected people on the other hand it can uh, inflate uh, anxiety level as well so that's what i i recommend you to question what do you need to know about the thing that you're interested in or what you're hearing if i can if i can comment on that because you bring up a lot of good points uh maybe i'll say this is because I, I think connectivity is great. The problem that I see is that we have humans in the loop making decisions and sharing what is really structured uh, data in a dynamic, unstructured way of human communication. And, and how we start to learn uh, from how we operate and start to leverage more and more structured communications between machines that allows humans to only then communicate for the things where humans are actually required. Um, that's where I see the biggest issue is as we connect more and more things, we haven't changed our SOPs and our TTPs for how humans interact with technology and therefore the data that we have. That's, to me, that's where I see the greatest limitation. And I would say it would be a, a knee-jerk reaction to then not connect. I would argue is, is we should connect things. We should start to change our TTPs 
for where humans should no longer be part of, uh, I'll say the kill chain. Okay, sorry. I was like, am I on mute? Um, I, I want to get uh, to, to next question in the chat, but first um, I, I want to get uh, Victor in, in, into this discussion. Um, and it's, uh, this question is first to Victor and then, then over to, to Mustafa. And the focus is on that, that Orient side of, uh, of the OODA loop. And Victor, if, if I'm talking military speak on the OODA loop, um, ha happy to explain. Um, but this idea of Orient being really difficult on sort of that machine learning uh, decision yeah. support uh, is, uh, how can Web3 uh, utilize that space to make it more effective? And so Victor, you know, specifically uh, to Anchan.ai, um, how do you use the combination of AI, ML and Web3 to orient cybersecurity? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, so I would say, yeah, like the Professor uh, Kanan just mentioned, right? There's a, the GAI, the general is AI, and then the narrow AI. I think as of right today, we are still in the narrow AI that's mostly data driven. So that means you have a mathematical machine learning model that is actually trained by, by data. By the data meaning is mostly uh, supervised learning. So you have, for example, if you want to detect a malware, you collect the samples of the malware, right? And then or, or there you compare to some benign samples, like maybe a Windows executable, that's your office, Microsoft Office and all that. And then you start letting the machine learning to feel, uh, to make, um, to kind of find out the decision boundary of what is good and bad. So this is actually the, the paradigm of most of the machine learning of today. It's a supervised learning, right? It's like image, detection, detecting object in the videos or recognizing the voice and all that, right? So, and then what we are doing is basically when I started Enchain AI, right? So, um, so basically we bring the machine learning best practice from the, the web two cybersecurity, I would say, right? And apply to the web three. Um, so what I mean is when we are fighting those APT malware, right? In the, like the nation state sponsor kind of cyber attacks and all that. So they will weaponize the, 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 the binaries and all that. And then um, they use some very character, certain characteristics. For example, um, like ransomware, give an example, right? Ransomware, they have certain steps in the behavior that you have to execute. You have to scan the full drive, find the file you want to delete, encrypt it, and delete it and then boom, send out the private key out, right? For the ransomware, um, for the ransom. So what we do is basically we focus on the using machine learning model to find out what is the behavior because for the adversaries, it's very hard to change the behavior, right? Those four steps I mentioned in the ransomware attack. But if you are talking about those polymorphic malware, they can alter the byte or bit, then you can entirely change the hash that would bypass all the detect uh, detection mechanism like the, the antivirus software is using. So we bring this kind of concept in using machine learning to find out the behavior characteristics on the blockchain and, and Web3, analyzing the smart contract, analyzing the transaction log to build a attribution around every single entity in this 1 billion addresses in the space. So basically, I mean, that's the mathematics behind what we're doing. And I think, um, yeah, it's been working pretty well by, because it's behavior uh, kind of detection. So most of the time we found we actually be able to outperform some of the, for example, right? The, the US government has the OFAC sanction list. So they have a list of uh, bad guys that you don't want to make any transaction with, right? So. But in space on this model would be the machine learning model would be we're able to detect ahead of time that okay this guy although it's not in the sanction list but it behaves similar to the one that is on the old fact sanction list so then we give a very high confidence score to that with a high probability that hey you better stay away from this so i think this kind of machine learning model can apply to 
the, the MPS and all the military setting as well, right? So I think actually the mathematics should have been applied in a lot of domains there. And, yeah, Michael, thanks for the question. Yeah. And, and so uh, to, to Mustafa, I, I'm curious from, from your perspective, um, how, how do you see Web3 applications uh, being of use uh, within sort of that AI ML uh, perspective, especially within the Orient space, or it, or is it not? Um, I, in the last time that I wrote an ML code, what was it was back in two thousand nine, so I don't really do anything on that domain more. But from the Web three perspective, again. Um, I'm dubious because um, Orient is, is a, philosophically looking into the problem. It's really different than the other uh, phases of the OODA loop to me. It is, uh, it, is, it is not just probabilities. It is possibilities as well. When we look at the Orient, unless I tell you what I have in my Orient phase, no one can access it. We don't have that capability. Back in the 50s, we thought that Russians were doing psychic war and we invested in $143 million that projects but didn't work we know that so unless i can i tell it and uh, no one can know it for example uh, to to distinguish uh, the the orient aspect of the decision making to me uh, or uda loop um if i would ask you the population of monterey city of monterey for example and you can you can just google it and find it so it is something that we don't know it's just out there, I need to search it and find it so it's accessible. I can minimize my unknowns by just Google. But if I would ask you at this point, 10, 10 20, how many people exist in the city of Monterey? No one can answer that question because it is about the people's decision making process that they have in Orient, right? So, uh, Oh, I decide, okay, I'd like to go to city of Monterey from Carmel to city of Monterey boundaries. And there is no way to know that unless you design the environment such that they act and tell you. You can see the same thing in, in TV show Mentalist, for example. How does he catch the people? He set up the environment and act, the, the, the criminals act in the way that he wanted and he understands them. So. That's, that's about designing the environment, set up the environment. That's what a physicist has been doing in uh, electron accelerators. We design the target environment such that when I send an electron, I know that I'm going to pick up the quark that I want to. And same thing true for humans, how we can set up the environment. So the Web3 for me is kind of a problem because suppose then uh, how can I know the population I know the population, but the number of people in the city of Monterey right at this moment, I can pull up Google Map. Google Map. How many people entered a destination in the city of Monterey? And Google Map can give me a roughly estimate. Still not known for sure, but it is better than previous situation that I was in. So Web3 in that sense can help us. But on the other hand, think about this. We are making us more predictable to the adversaries. We are just killing our Orient capabilities and putting everything into an environment that given enough time, someone can reach and know what I know, what I wanna do. So the point is how we can reverse engineer this and then uh, prime the other's adversaries decision environment orient such that they act in the way that we want, how we can minimize that unknown. That's where orient comes in. It is about the possibilities, but with the existing AI ML uh, algorithms, it's impossible because according to them, the, the system that we are simulating, it's always in a definite state. There is no internal ambiguity. But when we make decisions, we have an uh, vacillation. We have an ambivalence about the decision that we want to make. And that's the orient part. And it doesn't exist in AI and ML. And how we can leverage that? Yeah, there are some technologies or algorithm developments like uh, Hilbert space modeling, because Hilbert space modeling introduce you uh, amplitude. It's a uh, primitive concept. It's not probability. It gives you some sort of modeling technique, but it's not perfect, of course, but it's better than uh, regular probabilistic approaches. But 
Orient, we have to be careful, I believe, because we can just make us more, make ourselves more predictable, <laughs> like entering the destination to Google map. It is the same thing. Uh, so you're just giving out self, our others uh, about your orient. I'm going to go to city of Monterey. If I don't enter the Google map, nobody would know unless they have a tracking device on my car. So that's the point. That, that's the thing that we need to distinguish, I believe. I just uh, want to finish with, with Nick's question, uh, looking at, uh, you know, kind of Web3, is this a space uh, that, you know, is, is applicable to all services uh, it, it, or is it specific more to maybe one service or one organization? And I wanted to focus that question with Jay first and then uh, Victor. And, and the way I, I was thinking about this question was in terms of, you know, is Web3 really general purpose tech or tactics uh, that's, that's applicable from, from Cybercom all the way over to uh, uh, Infantry Platoon? Jay? Absolutely, great question. I think to answer that, we need to remember where Web 2.0 was 20 years ago. Like once upon a time when the internet was just invented, most people assumed it had no relevance to their operational workflows and it was just needed for FFRDCs to pass information back and forth. As people played with the tech and as they understood it well enough to see what it could end up doing, it has fundamentally transformed how our entire society operates, how business works, how we share information. And I think what we need to remember about stuff like blockchain is that we are only now in a position where the underlying tech infrastructure exists to exploit that capability. Like we couldn't do that until compute got to a certain point and cloud got to a certain point and networks got to a certain point. Um, and not to say that this is so early in its infancy that I don't think we have even like the beginnings of an understanding of its full ripple effects. You know, if you're looking where the tech is right now, it's at the far left side of the tech adoption curve, where some of your innovators are playing with it. And we're already seeing use cases for decentralized alignment. Dr. Fang brought up the fact that there's DAOs working on Ukrainian problems. What we need to think about is that creates a single point of collaboration where official government, aligned governments, surrogate governments, partner governments, and in some cases, even potentially like external forces could collaborate meaningfully. And I think that'd be really helpful. Like we, we've all served in joint environments where you're not just dealing with inner service challenges for coordination, but then you have to get a host nation approval process and the litany of other factors. And if we're using existing coordination mechanisms, that's Lord knows how many email threads, phone calls, VTCs, and other channels that aren't transparent, that are incredibly clunky, that don't allow us to move flat and fast. So even if you're just an infantry battalion attempting to do a live fire in Korea, like it can get really complicated if there's not some mechanisms through which we can afford radical transparency and accountability. So I think, you know, you could use it as a coordinating function, planning function for a host of use cases. And it, it's early enough now that we saw NFTs rise up and we saw crypto rise up uh, and, and those have gotten some of the attention. But going back to my earlier point is the community needs to understand what the tech can do so they can play with it. Organizations like DARPA and SBR funds exist so that we can start playing with the realms of these technologies and see how they can apply to our operational use cases. So I would, I, my bet is in the next five to 10 years, we're going to find tons of ways which fundamentally transforms the nature of a knowledge organization. Like uh, one of the, the things that we were looking at the other day was if you can give out tokens, some means of validating an individual contributed knowledge to a group, what might that mean for Intel analysts? So if I have a really smart E5 who's looking through the same reams of, of PAI or illicit data that everybody else is, but he ends up determining a pattern that nobody else has. And then he puts forward his product and his Intel analysis for consumer review. And then that gets cited or referenced internally or get shared or gets migrated up to, to Brigade. Right now, that soldier may not even know that he was impactful. Like there's no way to track where that idea went. And so like his staff section may understand that he's good, but we may not fully exploit the capability of that leader. If we can start using concepts like tokens or NFTs to track who originated information or insights, that then has force level impact, we could potentially heat map, hey, this person is an E4 or an O2, but they're able to contribute at a level that is disproportionately higher than what everybody else in their section is doing. And suddenly we can create density heat maps for like, where are we getting that Pareto optimized mission impact that is impossible to see in traditional mechanisms where just products are flying around through PowerPoint. We don't have a mechanism for tracking our capacity to learn as an organization. So I, I think we are going to see use cases and applications for almost everything we do as a military. 
And our speed in doing that is going to be contingent on how well we empower experimentation at the lowest level. Uh, and I'll turn it back to the panel. All right. And Victor? Yeah, totally agree with you, Jay. And I think um, the NFT and DAO and token, tokenomics and all that, I, to me, to us, it's just like the first wave of applications that people are thinking about how we can leverage Web3. And mostly in the private sector, when you talk about, oh, there's an innovation out there, right? The easiest thing, the thing to think about is really, well, can I make money out of it, right? So, and, and that's, uh, surprisingly, that's a $3 trillion market now, guys. So Web3 is a $3 trillion market now. And then I would think this is actually a foundation, a foundational uh, revolution also. This is actually changing the way how we define data ownership. And the Professor Kanan just mentioned, oh yeah, so we can Google the, uh, the, 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 the population of Monterey Bay and all that, right? So, well, but those, that, that kind of search, right? If let's say we move that kind of data query into the web three, right? What is that gonna be like, right? When we have the data ownership of all these different access and all that, if we can add the layer of privacy, data privacy, right there, we can make Web3 work in that military setting. Because like I said, this Web3 and cryptocurrency has been evolving in a super adversary environment in the past 10 years. It's a very tough environment. We are dealing with all those hackers. You, you don't even know where they're coming from. Like when Paul is analyzing the network lock from the cloud, at least they got an IP address. But when we are analyzing it, we only have a, private, a public key of a wallet address. So how do we contextualize? How do we pan the, the attribution around these behaviors and all that, right? That's actually, there's a lot of innovation need to be done. And how is that applied to the military setting and all that, right? Like I said, this is the early days of, of those application. So think about it. If you Go back to year 2004. Would you imagine you can order food using Uber, Uber E on your mobile phone? That was back 2004. That's, I think the iPhone was, I mean, was about to come out. And you're probably using those bulky phones and those not smartphones, right? So without that, that's uh, the, the mobile social media, uh, the social network we, will not boom. It's really kind of with that, at the point that, well, in 2005, 2006, when iPhone came out, and boom, the entire wave of Web2 really take, uh, take off. So right now, you never know that what would be the next big thing. Maybe that quantum computer or whatever, right? So there's a new wave of uh, a technology enabling um, like devices or whatever came out. Like most people that are now very excited about um, metaverse, for example, right? There may be a, a great application there when we figure out the, the, the headset problem, the metaverse and all that, right? So yeah, I think it's a, it's a great time for innovation and the way that we, we kind of, how to enable innovation is really to, to define a problem, like, uh, like Michael, you just said, define a problem and, and let's do a research and see how, what, what came out of it. So we are being doing this uh, at like UC Berkeley's and all that, and I think, um, it's being, uh, yeah, seeing a lot of uh, great application that how we enable Web3 for <laughs> using DAO for, for fundraising or define a new smart contract for digi another digital assets and all that. So yeah, so exciting, exciting time for Web3 innovation. Awesome, thank you, Victor. And so with that, uh, we're, we're at actually beyond time. Uh, so please join me in a round of applause uh, for, for our panelists. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Yes, thank you all. And I am going to move my clues set up back to a different part of the room because in our high-tech environment, Tech is only as useful as the user's capability, which mine is not fantastic right now. Um, so that completes the discovery that I am providing to you as our three teams working through this complex military problem space. However, once I release you to your rooms, I'd like the mentors to stay here with me, either in the virtual space or in the physical space, 
and we will strategize who is going to what room because I will then provide you a mentor or two in your room for as long as the facilitator will have you to do an individualized interview to fill in any gaps in your data before you begin to frame your problem from your synthesized data and launch into ideation. For those who have joined us for the Naval Warfare Studies Institute Sea Power Conversation, this concludes the Sea Power Conversation. I will post this recording on the Sea Power Conversation archive. Um, you can link through that through the Naval Warfare Studies Institute website. For those who are participating as the discovery panel, this recording will be posted on the workshop page under workshop resources once the Zoom cloud recording is available. So with that, I am going to release you to go do your work. The next workshop plenary session is tomorrow morning at nine Pacific Daylight Time here on Zoom Gov and back in Glasgow 109 Zoom Gov. We're going back to the standard plenary Zoom Gov access information. And I will send that out again by email today. All right, go do work.